So in this lesson of approaching the scene, I'm gonna kind of replay some of the highlights of this Michoacan, Mexico, Dia de Muertos, the Day of the Dead workshop uh, that I'm just wrapping up here in Uruapan, Michoacan. Uh, and along the way, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I set up you know, one of my favorite images from this trip and the way the circumstances worked out. I'm gonna talk a little bit about gear for working in really low lit conditions with moving subjects. And I mean by that, you know, middle of the night, after midnight, candlelight is the only light that you're working with and people that are moving around. So we'll talk a little bit about that. This is Approaching the Scene. I'm Hudson Henry. This is a series of weekly videos you know, where I talk about everything photographic, from capturing better images in the field to working through those images in post-production and conversations with other photographers that are out working in the field. Just kind of a discussion. I want it to be a discussion. I hope that you guys will send questions to me. It's really simple to email them to me at questions at hudsonhenry.com. You can also log on to my website at www.hudsonhenry.com slash ATS and put a question in there. And if you're enjoying these videos, please click like, please click subscribe and share them with your friends. So, you know, I'm here in the Mansion Cupitizio, which is one of my favorite hotels in the world. It's here in Uruapan, Michoacan, right on the edge of one of Mexico's national parks that's just filled with waterfalls and these kind of man-made sculpted waterfalls along with natural waterfalls. The river just rages. It's actually coming through a lot of lava. This is a volcanic mountainous region. We're up about 6,000 feet in elevation in this city. Uh, and actually there's like a, a little pool that the river starts from and just flows out of because it's coming subsurface through so much lava. There's big cascades. There's a lot of rainfall here. It's one of those tropical locations where you get thunderstorms in the afternoon. So, you know, we've got this beautiful park to walk through. Uh, I was able to, to, to get some family connections. My grandfather's best friend owned a fabrica down here in Michoacan in, in Uruapan, and we used that as a classroom, this big, huge, wide open killer space that they use for a lot of exhibits and giant art exhibits and class, classes now. And it still is a working fair trade, handmade fabrica with woven textiles. So a really, really cool place that was filled with all kinds of old machinery, and it was fun just to photograph in there. And then we took a horseback trip into this volcano. It's one of the world's youngest volcanoes that actually flowed out over a town in the 1940s and inundated the entire village. No one was killed. They had to move the whole village. And the last thing remaining is the spires of the old cathedral sticking up out of the lava. So we took horses down there and got in and photographed that in some kind of challenging lighting conditions. It was the sun was coming in and out. And it was real high contrast when the sun was out. But photographing it when the clouds were back behind was nice and doing some HDR photography with it and I wound up getting a really nice bit of time lapse in there to boot so I think the whole group really really enjoyed that we've been eating some epic food in some great locations we've eaten some traditional food and had some really incredible meals uh, with just handmade foods that are really really not the Mexican food you think of in the US and then kind of the penultimate part of this whole trip has been Dia de, los Muer or Dia de Muertos and the Noche de Muertos, the Day of the Dead and the Night of the Dead, uh, which was just a couple of nights ago. And we wound up up nearly all night photographing in these different cemeteries around Lake Pascua. It's one of the epicenters of the whole uh, Dia de Muertos celebration. Uh, and it was just a fantastic experience. You know, these people are out celebrating their ancestors. They build these shrines in the cemetery these that, that include all of their ancestors' favorite foods and drinks and photographs of them. And they sit quietly all night and remember their ancestors. It's this really beautiful thing. There's a lot of face painting. You know, there's some of the Halloweenish stuff that we're used to in, in traditional Western culture. But here, it's this connection to the past, to your ancestors, to your lost family members. Uh, and, you know, one of my workshop members, pretty much a lot of people were shooting with Nikon. We had a little bit of mirrorless too, but uh, one of my Nikon shooters brought along the Nikon 105 1.4 uh, prime lens. And I recommended everybody carry a fast prime lens. I had an 85 millimeter 1.8 and a 50 millimeter 1.8 and a 20 millimeter 1.8 and a small backpack to just move light, you know, and go handheld. You don't want to be so intrusive in something so sacred as that. Uh, and, and we traded lenses around a little bit. And I know I've often scoffed at a lens as heavy and as expensive and as you know, limited in its, in its focal range as the Nikon 
105, 1.4. But I gotta say that in this circumstance, it was just amazing. That longer focal length with that really wide aperture, let us keep the ISO down, let us keep the shutter speed a little bit faster and be a little less intrusive at the same time in something so sacred as people sitting around the graves of their ancestors. You know, it's fine to walk up with a wide angle and ask permission and getting close and photograph the scene, but sometimes it's nice to just get those candid moments from afar without even being intrusive at all. And we found that the people here were so welcome and so ingratiating um, that you know it was it was kind of an amazing thing to walk through something so uh, so special, so personal, and have them welcome us in. Uh, there were a lot more people down here this time than I expected, given that the the popularity and the success of the Disney Pixar movie Coco. If you haven't seen that, that tells the whole story and tradition. Uh, of this particular festival, this holiday, which is really one of the world's best. You owe it to yourself to come see it if you haven't uh, done so. So, you know, before I wrap up kind of talking about the experience here in this, in this particular just amazing workshop, I wanna talk about one of my favorite moments in it, which was while we were in the town of Pascuaro, one of the epicenters right on Lake Pascuaro, it's this old beautiful Spanish architecture town with amazing hand crafts and artisans. Uh, and we had lunch there and then we were wandering around photographing and we came along the Franciscan Monastery um, where it has these beautiful old Spanish walls and wrought iron gates and doorways. Uh, and, and we happened on the street upon this couple that was just amazingly done up for Dia de Muertos. The, the makeup, the clothes, the costumes, you know, jewels on the woman's face. She was just an incredible beauty. Both of them were really, really a beautiful couple. They were just wound up being spectacular models. They took direction well, the camera loved them, they loved the camera, and we had such a special place that we wound up working them into just becoming models for the workshop and, and the images were just stunning. And there's a couple where, you know, I just got really tight and I happened to be using that 105, 1.4 lens and just using the old stone walls of this beautiful old Franciscan monastery and, and just the images are almost perfect straight out of the camera. I was shooting with the Nikon D850, uh, you know, and I maybe know more for landscape and, and travel photography, but it's really fun when you're out uh, traveling to be doing those people portraits. I mean, I think that's a, a it's, anybody that's a travel photographer, you've got to be able to photograph food, interiors, people, landscapes, uh, and, and I had a blast with it. So this whole trip has been really, really wonderful. It's been challenging. I've got thousands of images to run through. Uh, that one, just everything worked out, you know. So I, I think whenever you're in a situation where there's a wedding or you've got a festival and people have really taken time to do themselves up, that winds up being a time when they're excited to be photographed. They're not shy about being photographed. So don't hesitate to offer to photograph them. Share your card, let them know you're willing to share images with them and they'll shine for your camera, you know. Some people are more photogenic than others and you just have to start photographing. It may surprise you who is. In this case, we got really lucky uh, and it really worked out well for the workshop. So, uh, you know, I did have a question about, you know, some, one person asking me that recently in low light conditions whether I preserve, prefer zoom lenses or primes. And they were really referring to Milky Way photography. And I'm gonna say that, uh, I do work a lot in low light Milky Way photography with my Nikon 14 to 24, but I've been thinking more and more about getting the previous generation of Zeiss Distagon 15 millimeter lenses just because you can snap it to the absolute end to that infinity focus and at the end stop, the hard stop at the end of the focus ring, it's absolutely focused at infinity. You don't have to go searching. And when we work with zoom lenses in low light, if you want to capture that infinity focus, if you're doing landscapes, you have to find it. You need to make marks on the barrel of the lens, either with some tape, uh, or you have to find it before dark and, and gaff tape your lens so it can't change focus because autofocus lenses, that, that the zoom autofocuses that we have today, tend to focus past infinity and back so that when that motor's snapping the focus mechanism around it, it doesn't break it when it hits a hard stop. Whereas your manual focus, well-made lenses like Zeiss and, 
and some of the old, you know, Voigtlander come to mind, some of the older manual focus lenses from Nikon, Canon, and others, Leica, obviously. When you focus it all the way to one side where the infinity symbol is, it hits a hard stop and it's at infinity in a well-made lens. So uh, it's nice for doing that kind of thing. And for the kind of low light photography I've been doing here, I think prime lenses make all the sense in the world. They're high quality, they're lighter than zoom lenses, they're simpler than zoom lenses, and they tend to come with wider apertures. And you have, you've got your 51.4s, your 51.8s, your 20s, your 28s. Even this 105, 1.4, that wound up being the winner on this trip. So again, that's one more little note. If you wind up going to a low light festival or if you're photographing a low light wedding or something you know has really low light and you're a Nikon photographer, I know this is a really unique lens to be a 1.4, 105. Try that lens out. You know, the difference between 1.4 and your 70 to 200's 2.8 is two stops of light. And if you think about the noise differential between 6400 ISO and 1600 ISO, that's what we're talking about. So keep that in mind. All right, everybody. So that's this approaching the scene. Again, you know, if you're enjoying the series, please click like, please, please click subscribe. Um, and share it with your friends. If you have questions, I'd love you to join the conversation. Just send them to questions at hudsonhenry.com or log on to my website at www.hudsonhenry.com slash ATS. Thanks, and uh, we'll see you on the next adventure.